So uh, the title of this talk is Making the Most of Animation Blueprints and kind of subtitled with Dynamic Motion in Fortnite. So first off, who am I? I am a senior tech animator at Epic. I've been working on Fortnite for about the last year, year and a half. Uh, previously, I worked on Paragon and a few um, movies and other games. Uh, either way, I have been doing rigging, simulation, uh, character work, gone by many titles, rigger, creature TD, technical animator, character TD, technical artist, but they're all kind of the same thing. Um, creating simulation, attaching verts to bones, and um, making them move good. So uh, specifically on Fortnite, tech animator is uh, creating the skeleton, the uh, scum mesh, doing the rigging, and um, adding the simulation on top. Uh, Fortnite has been in development for many years, and there's kind of a standard um, motion set on the characters already, so the skeleton is pretty fixed for the biped. Um, we have six uh, body types, but they're all retargeted on the same skeleton. So that is fixed. All other bones that we want to add in, we, uh, we do that later on individual skeletons, and I'll go over that in a bit. Um, this talk is kind of broken up into two parts. The first, I'm just going to go over what is a character in Fortnite, how do they kind of all combine and get assembled, and then I'm going to go over more the uh, dynamics and individual nodes, how we kind of assemble those, and um, uh, some specific settings that might help you out, hopefully. So what is a character? In this case, we're looking at a constructor, uh, one of our Save the World characters. And you see a body and a head, some hair, an extra little robotic arm and a backpack. Uh, every character is going to have a head and a body. That's kind of how we define our characters. And um, that can be kind of weird. For instance, we had a banana character recently. Where's the head defined on a banana? I don't, I don't know. But we got creative, and it worked out. Um, and in this case, uh, the, the beard and hair, which we call face accessories, uh, those will have their own um, animation blueprint, their own skeleton. Uh, all of these will have their own skeleton animation blueprint and will kind of be combined and right along. So diving in a little deeper, I kind of feel like our job is uh, moving just files around. These are all the files that might make up a character. Uh, we'd probably consolidate some of these, but again, every character is going to have uh, hair, which hair, skeleton, animation blueprint, and a data item or a data asset. Uh, that data asset, which we call character parts, uh, contains references to the scale mesh, the animation blueprints, the master skeleton, which everything is retargeted on, and uh, a few other things. You can do material overrides and such on that. I think there's a whole other talk just about those data assets as well. Zooming out a little further, we see what makes up another what makes up a character in its completion. There's a character item definition, hero item definition, and a hero specialization, and multiple character parts. All of those are data assets, and all of those uh, contain some amount of information about what the character is. Once we get into character parts, that's where, as a technical animator, we start working. We start uh, adding in our references to our animation blueprints, our scale meshes, skeletons, and any other number of things. Uh, this can get quite complex, especially on something like a progressive character. Um, we have a Viking character or a pirate character, and those may have five or ten different tiers, all of those with individual scale meshes, skeletons, animation blueprints, character parts. That gets quite unwieldy, and so carrying those all the way across the finish line can be a bit of a challenge. So how do we do that? Uh, copy pose for mesh is kind of our go-to node. And uh, in this case, um, that's what gets all the animation from that invis skeleton or that base skeleton onto our characters. Um, every skeleton or every scale mesh that you see is an attachment onto that base skeleton. And uh, that, that way that we get the performance of just running one skeleton, everything gets attached on. So on the servers, you'll just see these invisible skeletons running around and everything gets propagated locally. So some of the settings here on the copy pose from Mesh is uh, the use attached parents, and that's actually what gets the motion from that base skeleton. Uh, that's what we use on nearly every uh, animation blueprint. This is how we start. 
uh, except for a few exceptions, wherever it was attached to a bone or a socket. And that would be using probably a, a, a subgraph input or something like that, uh, just for performance reasons. Um, so a copy pose from mesh essentially does just bone mapping, direct bone mapping. So if the bone exists in the base skeleton or the, the parent skeleton, and it exists in the uh, attachment skeleton, then it'll just drive those directly. And um, that way, in your child skeleton, uh, you can add as many bones as you need, drive those individually with the animograph, and then you can get layers of motion. And that's really where the work comes in. On a character, again, we can have tons of different things. Um, backpacks can take on various uh, um, shapes, sizes, motion sets, uh, <laughs> all kinds of random things. Um, hair and beards can practically be an entire character of their own. Um, clothing can be everything from a giant skirt or dress to whatever we can imagine, to a banana if you want. Um, Danglies are just like anything that's hanging off, and danglies can be uh, on a pickaxe. It can be on uh, on here. Her hair would be represent some of that. The wings can have dynamic simulation that would just kind of be dangling, um, and we layer all of those on. So this gets really tricky when we're um, talking about putting a character across a dozen different platforms and um, still having them feel dynamic, still having them feel like they're the same character. If you spend real money on a character, you want to be able to play that character, whether it's on your phone or on the Switch, Xbox, PC. And uh, that becomes really tricky as a technical animator to make that work. Um, the way we approach it is uh, you start from the bottom. You start with the lowest common denominator. So if you're doing a dress, how can that dress, when everything gets LOD down, still feel and react like it's part of that character? And uh, when you're on a mobile device, we're not actually using some of the simulation libraries like Rigid Bodies and Dynamics uh, and a couple others. But we still have a few other tools that we'll get into later to get some of that motion. Um, the, the key thing to think about is healing off these layers of simulation and still making it work, like maybe just skinning to the legs and adding uh, some corrective bones or some corrective shapes, and then adding a simulation layer on top of that, which might be another skeleton, not an actual skeleton, but more bones that can be LOD'd off and still parent the skinning back up. And the key of this course is test every LOD all the way through because you will see it. Uh, on some of our gameplay modes, you can have 20 characters, 50 characters all in one place. And um, you may only have three LOD or three characters that are LOD1, the next tier LOD2, the next tier LOD3, and those can all be on screen at the same time. So they all have to look pretty good, hopefully. Um, and with the most complex graphs, if we're doing a lot of complex um, evaluations in the event graph, then we try and nativize that into code after the art has been complete. And that gives us a lot of performance. So let's dive into uh, a node here. We're going to dive into the rigid body a little bit. And in this case, we have it on a pickaxe on this floppy shark. And uh, here, I wouldn't really call this a dangly, though I think we do have a dangle there on the rope. Um, but we needed this to kind of have that rubbery feel, and we want the rigid bodies here. Um, I don't know if we can quite see those numbers on there, but um, starting at the top, that's where our physics asset would be, though I think in this case we put the physics asset on the scale mesh. Um, going into uh, the gravity settings, we're not using it here, but on most of our characters, uh, we actually explicitly set the gravity. That allows us to control the weights of the assets. And kind of an odd legacy thing that happened on Fortnite is uh, years ago, just as people were messing around and kind of game jamming uh, the, the whole game, gravity got set to about three times gravity. And that's just now how gravity is in Fortnite. So we're countering all that back on our animation nodes, um, back to real world gravity just to make things work. Uh, and that was actually a real challenge for us because we couldn't figure out why our rigid bodies were breaking all the time. The 
it's, things were jittering all the time. And I, I've gone online and I've, I've read a lot of people about these same type of issues. Uh, and hopefully I can dive into how to help that out a little. But setting gravity explicitly helped a lot. Um, setting your simulation space helps a lot. Uh, when you have a character that's running around in world space, which here we do have it set to world space, though. We should probably change that. Uh, when you're in a vehicle and moving at what un unknown speed, everything's going to be uh, pulled away from your character. You're not able to control it. So usually we simulate either in component space, root bone space, or if you have uh, a bunch of dynamics on the shoulders, we might just do spine four, uh, spine five space, and then infuse more motion using that component linear acceleration scale and component uh, velocity scale. Um, those essentially infuse world um, velocities back into the asset. So danglies, that's what we're calling them here because I don't know what else to call them. Um, we're looking at a couple different nodes here. We have the trail controller, the aerodynamics nodes, and constraints. Um, I think constraints are a little newer in the engine. Has anyone used them at all? Excellent. I'll talk about constraints. So <laughs> all they are is uh, you, you enter in some bonus, uh, kind of a parent constraint or a uh, barnacle or a rivet, if you're familiar with any of those terms. Um, it attaches uh, an object to the surface. Uh, or wherever you place a bone, and then uh, rides along based off the percentages of the bones listed there. So in this case, we have uh, a ring and a skull. At the, so a skull on the hip, which is weighted 100% to the skirt and 0% to the pelvis. Uh, so it's parented to the skirt, I suppose. Um, and you can drive those live. So if, if you wanted to uh, swap out the, the kind of space switch, uh, that skull, Whenever a character does some specific motion, you could absolutely do that. Uh, this has been crucial for us to get all you know um, bullets sitting on the chest or um, some sort of layers of simulation, and then something that sits on top of that, and that thing on top can have its own simulation. And uh, since this is all a linear process, you can layer these in very specific ways to get the type of motion that you want. Um, trail controller is not uh, in the simulation library, which means that we can use that on mobile. And that has kind of been our saving grace for everything, um, for uh, capes and for various objects. I think in here we're using a little bit of trail controller for um, the sword has some of it, I think. Um, and that way we can still get some of that life in the character as we peel away those layers and get down onto mobile. Um, so a trail controller is a lag-based, positional-based um, node where, as you pull, the, it just comes right back to ref pose over a period of time. And you can define how quickly that is. You can define a curve to, uh, uh, as it finds its children to how quickly it returns to ref pose. But the downside to that is you don't get any overlap. You don't get that secondary motion that you need. And so you can combine that with things like the spring controller, which is also not in the simulation library, which works on mobile for us, um, and get that secondary motion uh, kind of layering on these. Um, we also see aerodynamics here. Aerodynamics, uh, some people love it, some people hate it. I love it. Uh, aerodynamics is essentially a pendulum. You're hanging a pendulum off of a bone and the bigger you make the body, the slower it'll move. You can make it kind of like a pancake, and it'll just wobble. Um, and it has you can alpha it on. You can do all kinds of uh, tricky things with this. And I have a, a little bit in here where we talk about um, kind of being sneaky and, and driving simulation, uh, using different simulation uh, nodes to get exactly what we want. So uh, let's dive into a specific asset type. Backblings. Um, backblings encompass anything that attaches to the back. Uh, in this case, we have four different types. We have just kind of a static backpack, a dynamic backpack, a cape, and some wings. Uh, they attach to a socket, so they won't be using that copy pose from mesh. They'll probably be using a subgraph input. And uh, that means that they don't know where the shoulders are. They can't react to how the spine bends. 
uh, but we still need it to attach and feel um, like it's grounded to the character and still react to the character. Uh, and that goes back to selling that fantasy being consistent across all platforms. So um, the backpack on the right, the static one, that's just geometry and a bone. There's nothing fancy about it. Uh, the next one, we're seeing some uh, rigid bodies in action. Uh, having it um, just kind of move with the character, we're able to simulate in component space, and that just gives it that feeling that it's part of the character. Um, since it's, uh, I think we're driving in some of those forces, the component linear scale and velocity scale, um, to make it so when you move and run and twist, you can um, get specific motion. And since uh, you have each axis available in those component scalers, you can say, uh, only when I twist, feed in more motion, or only when I move on a vertical axis, feed in more motion, and you can very, get very specific about the type of motion you want in there. So uh, the cape is, uh, I think here we're seeing it as a cloth solution. Um, Though we do use both cloth and uh, trail controller, and I'll go into that a little bit more here next. Um, the cloth solution is a little tricky because we have to, uh, back into the character parts, we define uh, what we call cape colliders. And a cape collider is a base set of uh, uh, physics bodies that that cape can collide against, and it just moves to wherever those bones are. Uh, that allows us to collide against a character, but is a little tricky to get going at the first place. And the wings are kind of the most complex here because they have an entire state machine. They have uh, specific poses that we're driving based off what the character's doing. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit more here. So capes, it was a, a pretty tricky thing, just trying to figure out how we're gonna get that to work on mobile. How do we get that to work on uh, PC? How do we get it to still look good? feel like it's this cloth just draped from a character. Um, characters can take on any, any size and shape. But again, how do you put a cape on a banana? Well, you can. Um, in this case, uh, we're seeing the trail controller in motion. And uh, you can see it kind of just return to that ref pose uh, as you move sideways. But it, it gives it that kind of secondary motion. And in this case, we do have three chains. Um, so there's a, a first chain and then two forks. And that way we can control the stiffness of the upper versus the bottom of the, of the cape. Uh, we standardized the skeleton and the simulation mesh so that any cape that you create gets put onto that skeleton and then you automatically get all this behavior that we worked so hard to get uh, kind of for free. And that makes it so now we can create a cape in about five minutes. Um, and for the cloth, you can... Uh, just use the same simulation mesh. Even if it's long or short, you still, uh, we have standardized that, so it just makes it really quick to get the behavior. Uh, the, again, we, we're going into um, peeling off layers. So at lower LODs, we can uh, manipulate the trail controller, uh, LOD out bones, and still get some of that simulation that we need. Um, but I think at the lowest LOD, stiff as a board, just sticking off your back. Diving in a little, into back blings, or uh, sorry, into wings. Um, here we're seeing the, the animation play on the wings based off the character's performance. So whenever the character aims down sights, uh, the wings pull back. And the primary reason for that is when you aim down sights, the camera zooms right over the shoulder and you don't want wings blocking that. So we're getting those out of the way um, and it kind of gives it a cool behavior. Uh, we also have, you know, when you start sprinting, those wings kind of fold back a little bit. When you skydive, the wings come out uh, all of those are just individual poses, and we're blending into each pose. Um, and you can see down at the bottom here, um, we're doing a little behavior in the animograph to uh, pull the pawn speed. So the faster you go, blend in the wings between a sprint and a base kind of idle pose. Um, that's just one place where we um, layer that on top of the state machine. All right. Hair. Can't really say this is how we do all our hair, but this is how we do, I mean, every hair gets a, its own treatment. Um, so in this case, we're using 
uh, Anim Dynamics and uh, trying to be a little clever with it. Um, in Anim Dynamics, you're, you're able to define uh, collision spheres, and that's what's allowing us to get those uh, little ponytails to react to the shoulder when the shoulders come up. Uh, we're also able to feed in our alpha. Uh, has anyone used um, aerodynamics or fnterp or anything like that to get some of that behavior? So in this case, basically, based upon speed, um, we're using the fnterp uh, abilities of the alpha node, or of the alpha parameter on aerodynamics to uh, change the way that that hair bounces. Um, the art director said it's bouncing too much when we're running, tone that down, and this allows us to do that dynamically. Um, and since you can also change the way that it alphas on and off, you can um, use the interp speed also in that parameter to make it so it can blend on really quick and then settle again when you stop running. So you don't get this like, jump, start shaking, stop immediately, uh, which you usually get with that type of alpha. All right, so cloth. We might spend a little time here. <laughs> so uh, we never know what animation is going to play um, on a character. They have a base traverse set that's been set for years. Um, but at the end of the day, new um, emotes, dances, and behaviors are being created. And always st stress test the setups that we've created. So in this case, um, I created a dress out of rigid bodies and um, tried to lay, uh, the, the front leg straps kind of flung up way too much. They're way too active. Uh, and when you're running from a third person view, all you see are these leg straps kind of coming over the body. Um, and so I treated that a little differently, which you see in that graph there. Um, so diving into rigid body first, kind of to describe what I'm doing. Um, usually, if you do a setup like this, you get a lot of jitter. Um, and I'm sure some of you have experienced that before. Uh, the first thing that I learned was uh, controlling my mass per body is extremely important. So I start kind of with a power of two mentality. On the uh, lowest child, I always start the body at a mass of one and do mass 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. You always want the sum of the children to be less than the parent. Uh, and that kind of takes uh, anywhere you do rigid bodies, that's true. Um, if you want it to be more extreme, so the lower bodies move a lot more, then you can do 1, 5, 10, I don't, I don't You can kind of fuss from there. Um, another thing that we're doing here is we're creating cross constraints. So uh, you can create your own constraints uh, between bodies. Uh, first, you get just, you know, what do I have, like five, 10 chains there. Um, and then I, I'll create a cross constraint between two. You don't want to do it between every single one. Um, that just doesn't give the bodies anywhere to go. You want to give some flexibility. So I'll do like every two or every three. And that way, um, your leg doesn't just slip, be oh, slip between. <laughs> uh, the, the dress, rather, it'll uh, kind of move it out of the way because those bodies will still uh, stick together and kind of give you a cloth approach. Um, and then I think I pretty much always have some spring on here, some level just to try and pull those back together. Uh, for the cross constraints, the springs are pretty high. And I, don't, I really don't want those bodies to pull apart too much. Um, I want them to go along for the ride. But if you go too high, again, you get jitter. And that's kind of a balancing point. So uh, that all describes this first dress node. Um, but there's a lot more going on in this character. Um, in order to kind of prevent those cloth strips from flying out of nowhere uh, and really screwing up everything, we went ahead and added these anodynamics nodes. So where I'm doing that, you see on this kind of dangly's rigid body, um, there's two uh, sets of blocks on the bottom are the rigid bodies that are colliding with the shins. Um, 
But the only way they're doing that is they're being, or sorry, they're not actually colliding there. It appears that they're colliding. Um, I'm driving the upper part of the legs with aerodynamics because uh, I can really control that motion and I can control the way that it, it flies out. So instead of hitting a body and bouncing out like I was getting with rigid bodies, I can just say, just kind of dangle between here. And uh, then I use those as kinematic bodies to then drive the simulation of the lower part. Um, I do this type of thing all the time, and it really allows me uh, to art direct the simulation. And that can be one of the hardest parts, as when the art director says, hey, tweak this one little thing, and then it breaks your entire setup. Um, you may have noticed that these are all rigid bodies in anodynamics. So how does any of this work on mobile? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so uh, what I'm doing for mobile is I'm adding a trail controller for all the skirts. Now, one of the key problems with trail controllers, since it's lag-based, um, it doesn't care where it goes. So if she ran backwards, that skirt would just go straight through the body. Um, so based off the direction of the character, I blend on and off trail controller. And I try and do that slowly so you don't pop back into a position. Um, and uh, I also have uh, spring controllers for uh, all the fur around her neck. So I have basic simulation for happening for that, which you see in those rigid bodies. But then once we go into mobile, I'm using spring controller just to get a little bounce. Um, as far as those uh, leg cloth things, those, I think, just deform with the legs, and they look pretty good enough at a lower LOD. So beyond simulation, um, we have to make everything look good all the time. Um, and in this case, we have this guy just crouching. And it doesn't really look like much, but, at, but uh, that little llama on his hip normally would just pierce right through his thigh. And we have you know, uh, all kinds of pouches and grenades and all kinds of things that always get attached there. And that always ends up being a, an issue. So our approach to correct is generally, let's go back here, uh, is to use uh, this get delta, ref, uh, get delta transform from ref pose. And again, this is a newer node that um, I worked with the anim engineers to create. We were normally doing the math. I don't want to do the math. So um, this just makes it really easy to uh, get a bone and get it in a specific space. And we use these all over the place. On the, the backpacks and the capes and everything, uh, if you have a really long backpack and you look up, it goes right through the chest or right through the stomach. And so uh, we'll get a reference to the body or to the invis skeleton. And um, I like to get the head in spine five space. And that just gives me kind of a drastic angle. Um, if you just said, look up, well, you can do this. And it doesn't have any effect. If you say, well, whenever the spine five goes up, well, you could lay down. And that theoretically rotated in root space or component space. Um, and that still doesn't give you what you need. But um, the head into like uh, spine or pelvis space, that was giving me exactly what I wanted. But in this case, I am taking a look at the left thigh. And um, uh, whenever I crouch, I kind of defined my angles here and was able to generate an alpha. So I just remap that 0 to 1. And I feed that in my anim graph there at the top uh, into that transform model by bone. Now, it's not uh, the most performance way to do that, I'll admit. Uh, but it gives us exactly what we need. And then whenever. Uh, the art director says, hey, can we tweak this out a little bit more? You don't have to go all the way back into uh, your DCC, my air blender, and, um, and create a pose or animate it. You can just do it right there in the engine. Pose driver. Has anyone used pose driver before? Anyone? Awesome couple. The pose driver is um, in, in Maya, we will create a set of poses for the character. Um, I usually record these straight out of game because uh, I want those angles to be exact. So if I'm aiming and I look up, I want the shoulder pads to react uh, to that motion. I don't want it to, um, uh, 
to kind of guess. So if I just place, create an animation of this type of thing and then um, adjust my shoulder pads in there uh, to react to those, I may never hit those angles in Engine unless if I create an animation that looks exactly like that. Um, but that's not a good way to validate it. So in this case, a pose driver um, allows me to uh, create a set of animations for bones that I'll be watching, and then a set of animations for the, or a set of poses for the bones that I'll be driving. Um, so you see those big old cages over the shoulder pads. Uh, those are all being driven based off of the clavicle and the upper arm. Um, there's a few rules with pose drivers, or not, some guidelines with pose drivers. Uh, the fewer bones that you're watching, the better. So if you try and watch uh, all your clavicle, upper arm, and maybe your spine, um, all of those bo bones have to line up to that exact right place for you to hit that pose. So you want there to be some wiggle, wiggle room. You may hit it, and then that corrective pose will just pop on. And um, then you wonder, why am I never getting this look? So I like to narrow it down to just that shoulder, upper arm pose, if I can. If I'm not quite getting that, then I'll add in a clavicle. Um, you also see here in the middle picture that I have it split out into four. Um, that's because I get poses that may be very similar when I'm skydiving to aiming a spe specific weapon. Um, but I don't want those skydiving poses to muddy up my, um, my weapon poses. So I create new pose drivers. I detect if my character is skydiving. And uh, if it is, then I swap over to that other graph. I spent a long time using uh, quaternions, and that made it very difficult because anytime you do a little twist or something in your pose, you may completely lose. Um, a, it, that kind of invalidates all other spaces that your arm could be in. So um, in this case, I'm using a swing angle. I, I should have had a graphic of all the settings. but. Um, and the, in this case, on the right, we're seeing, um, I think, 12, 15 poses. I do recommend the fewer poses, the better, um, if you can. Otherwise, let's say if you try and do poses all the way up the arm, like five different poses, then it'll just pop between them, or you get this kind of jitter effect, which is at all, not at all what you want. Um, Another thing is I break out per shoulder, uh, again, because I don't want to be watching both right clavicle, right, left clavicle, right shoulder, left shoulder. Um, I, I break each arm into its own. Uh, in some cases, I'll have uh, like eight different pose drivers looking at all different things, because I really want to isolate the problem. And uh, I went through that really quick. so. Thank you. <laughs>